Mechanical equilibrium in simple words is a state of physical balance. In this module, we will study the conditions under which a rigid body is in equilibrium. Look at this picture of a book on a table top and small rocks placed one over other precariously balanced. These are common examples of mechanical equilibrium. If one observes them carefully, they all, the book and each rock are in a state of rest. This suggests the different forces acting on the constituents must be zero. But we have also learned that there are systems in motion when net forces on them are zero. Here we deal only with the static equilibrium. So, one can say the term mechanical equilibrium implies the object is at rest, that is static mechanical equilibrium. Second, center of mass moves with constant velocity, that is a dynamic mechanical equilibrium. Static equilibrium represents a common situation in engineering practice and its principles are of special interest to civil engineers, architects and mechanical engineers. The bridges, buildings, etc. are to be kept intact under the influence of many forces acting on them. The principles of equilibrium are very often used in designing them and explain their conditions. The conditions for mechanical equilibrium hence are, as we know when a system is in equilibrium, the particle does not accelerate as the net force is zero in an inertial frame of reference. That is vector sum of all the forces acting on the particle is zero. For an extended body, the equivalent statement is that that the center of mass of the body has zero acceleration. This is often called the first condition for equilibrium. It is also called the condition for the translational equilibrium. In vector and component forms, it can be written as F net is equal to 0, this is equation 1a. In component forms, it can be written F x component net is equal to 0. Similarly, the net y component of force will be also 0 and the net component of force along z will be also 0. This gives us the equation 1b. The second condition for an extended body to be in equilibrium is that the body must have no tendency to rotate. For a rigid body that in an inertial frame not rotating about a certain point has zero angular momentum about the point of rotation. This means that the sum of torques due to all the external forces acting on the body must be zero. This gives us the second condition for equilibrium. It is also called the condition for the rotational equilibrium. In vector form, it can be written as net torque is equal to zero. This gives us the equation 2a, while in component form, we can write net x component of torque will be zero, the net y component of torque will be also zero and the net z component of torque will be zero. This gives us the equation 2b. The above equations 1a and 2b actually gives us six independent conditions to be satisfied for a mechanical equilibrium of a rigid body for a real life situation or a three dimensional space. That is a lot of condition in fact six in all. In case all the forces acting on the body are coplanar, that means we are talking about a two dimensional object, then we need only three conditions to be satisfied for mechanical equilibrium. Two of these conditions corresponds to translational equilibrium. For example, if a plane object lies in x y plane, then the translational equilibrium condition will be net x component of force is 0, net 
y component of force will be 0? This is because the object it was lying in the plane of x and y. The third condition corresponds to rotational equilibrium. The sum of the components of torques along any axis perpendicular to the plane of force must be 0. As the plane of the object is x y, then the torque about z axis will be 0. So, in all we had three conditions for mechanical equilibrium for a two dimensional object. Since all these forces act on a single particle, they must be concurrent. A body or a system may also be in partial equilibrium. That is, it may be in translational equilibrium and not in rotational equilibrium or it may be in rotational equilibrium but not in translational equilibrium. The conditions of equilibrium of a rigid body are more exhaustive as compared with that foreign particle, which we have done in earlier chapter of laws of motion. Since rotational motion was not considered in case of equilibrium of a particle, hence the condition of rotational equilibrium is not considered for a particle. Therefore, only the condition for translational equilibrium that is f net is equal to 0 applies to a particle in equilibrium. Let us watch a small activity with a scale. Is this scale in equilibrium? For any position of my hand, what all forces are acting on this extended object? Every part of this scale is under the influence of gravitational force which is trying not only to accelerate them towards it, but it tries to rotate them also. For a specific position, the scale is in equilibrium. That specific point or position is called center of gravity. So, we can say center of gravity is the point in a body around which the resultant torque due to gravity forces vanishes or becomes zero. This concept of center of gravity can be useful in designing structures, especially buildings, bridges that can remain stable under the influence of forces acting on them. It can be also helpful in understanding the behavior of moving bodies when gravitational forces are acting on them. The center of gravity is not necessarily the geometric center of the object as it was in the case of a scale. Let us try it with a spoon. If we try to balance it in the center, the weight of the spoon end will pull that end down and it will eventually rotate. But the spoon remains in equilibrium when it is balanced about its heavier end. The object in equilibrium about its center of gravity because the weight on each side is equal. To be more precise, the moments caused by the weight on each side balance out and the object does not move. One can easily determine the location of center of gravity of an arbitrary shaped planar object. One can simply follow this particular step. Just balance a planar object using a string or a edge from a point at which the object is balanced, that point will be called center of gravity. Another way can be a two step method. Step 1, hang the planar object from any point like A. Draw a line on the object along the string or which passes through your point of suspension. Let it be A, A1. For step 2, repeat the procedure from another point like B on the object and draw a line on the object along the string or passing through the point of suspension. Let us say it is B, B1. The intersection of the two line gives us the location of center of gravity for a given object. 
here it is denoted as capital G. This procedure works well for an irregularly shaped object which are pretty hard to balance. For a non-planar three-dimensional object, one requires three points of suspension not all lying in the same plane. Let us try to locate the center of gravity of an irregular shaped object mathematically. Consider an irregular shaped cardboard placed over a narrow tipped object like a pencil which is in a state of a static equilibrium. Let that point be capital G. By definition we know that point is the center of gravity. Let the cardboard remains in horizontal position. This point of balance capital G is the center of gravity of the cardboard. One can see in this figure that the cardboard is in state of rest over a tip of a pencil. The tip of the pencil provides a vertical upward force R due to which the cardboard is in mechanical equilibrium. As shown in the figure, the reaction of the tip is equal and opposite to mg which is the total weight of the cardboard or the force of gravity. Hence, the translational equilibrium equation can be made capital R is equal to mg. It is also in rotational equilibrium as the cardboard is not trying to rotate. If it was not due to the unbalanced torque, it would have tilted, rotated and eventually fallen. There are torques on the cardboard due to the force of gravity like m1g, m2g, etc., which are acting on the individual particles which make up the cardboard. So, therefore, we can say there are actually infinite number of molecules or particles on the cardboard. So, there are infinite number of forces which are acting and they are trying to rotate the object about the center of gravity. As the center of gravity of the cardboard is the point where net torque due to its forces is 0, if R i vector is the position vector of the ith particle of an extended body with respect to center of gravity, then its torque about center of gravity due to force of gravity on the particle will be given as tau i vector will be equal to r i vector cross m i into small g vector. The total gravitational torque about the center of gravity is 0. Hence, we can write summation i goes from 1 to n tau i vector which gives us the net torque about the center of gravity will be equal to summation i i goes from 1 to n r i vector cross m i into g vector. This is equal to 0. We notice that in the above equation, acceleration due to gravity is same for all the particles. Hence, small g vector can be taken out of the summation. Therefore, it will become summation i goes from 1 to n r i vector cross m i. This comes in bracket and then small g vector is equal to 0. This becomes our equation 1. We can conclude from that summation i goes from 1 to n r i vector cross m i is equal to 0. As position vector of center of mass of a given system is given as r vector for center of mass will be equal to summation i goes from 1 to n r i vector cross m i divided by summation i goes from 1 to n m i. The equation 2 can be written as r c m position vector will be equal to 0. This suggests that the origin must be the center of mass of the body. Thus, the center of gravity of the body coincides with the center of mass in uniform gravity or gravity free space. The center of mass of the rigid body is fixed in relation to its constituent particles. But the center of gravity will shift if 
the value of small g vary from point to point. When the body is small, acceleration due to gravity does not vary from one point of the body to the other. But if the body is so extended that the acceleration due to gravity varies from part to part of the body, we can't take small g common as we have done in case of equation 1. As a result, then the center of gravity and center of mass will not coincide. The two do not always coincide, however. For example, the moon's center of mass is very close to its geometric center. Why we are saying that? It is not exactly at its geometric center because moon is not a perfect uniform sphere, but its center of gravity is slightly displaced towards earth because the stronger gravitational force on the near side of moon. Basically, the concept of center of mass and center of gravity are two different concepts. The center of mass has nothing to do with gravity. It depends only on the distribution of the mass of the body. It is the point where if external force acts, then it shows purely translational motion. While in case of latter, that is center of gravity for a given system, it is about the point where net torque due to gravitational forces acting on its different constituents is zero or the system is in rotational equilibrium due to gravity only or gravitational forces I would say. It is also considered to be a point where the weight of the system is effectively acting. Hence, its determination is going to be very useful for civil engineers for designing buildings and bridges which can withstand the load and deforming forces acting on them. And remember, the earth's gravitational force is always acting on them. Let us do a small problem to apply the concept of equilibrium and center of gravity. We have just explored. Consider a metal bar 70 centimeter long and 4 kg in mass supported on a two knife edges placed 10 centimeter from each end. A 6 kg load is suspended at 30 centimeter from one end. Find the reactions at the knife edges. Assume the bar to be of uniform cross section and homogeneous. The figure shows the rod AB, the position of the knife edges K1 and K2, the center of gravity of the rod at capital G and the suspended load at point P. Since the rod is homogeneous and we are considering small g to be uniform throughout, the capital G point will be the center of the rod. The rod is homogeneous, so the center of mass and center of gra gravity will coincide for the rod. Here, AB is equal to 70 centimeter, AG is equal to 35 centimeter, AP is equal to 30 centimeter, PG is equal to 5 centimeter, AK1 and BK2 will be equal to 10 centimeter while K1G and K2G will come out to be 25 centimeter. Also given weight of the rod to be 4 kg weight, while the suspended weight which is W1 is given to be 6 kg weight, R1 and R2 are considered to be the normal reactions of the support at the knife edges K1 and K2. For translational equilibrium of the rod, the net forces along vertical direction is 0. Therefore, we can write R1 plus R2 minus W1 minus W is equal to 0. This gives us equation 1. We must note that W1 and W2 act vertically down and R1 and R2 act vertically up. For considering rotational equilibrium, we can take moments of forces about a convenient point 
let that point be capital G. The moments of R2 and W1 are anticlockwise, hence they are taken to be positive, whereas the moment of R1 is clockwise. For rotational equilibrium, the net torque is 0, hence we can write minus R1 into K1G plus W1 into Pg R2 into K2G is equal to 0. This gives us equation 2. Remember here the angle between the forces and the position vectors where the forces are acting is 90 degree and negative signs are taken for clockwise torques while positive signs are taken for anticlockwise torques. It is given that W is equal to 4 small g that is mg and W1 is equal to 6 g Newton where small g is the acceleration due to gravity. We take the value of small g to be 9.8 meter per second square then if you substitute them in equation 1, we will get R1 plus R2 minus 4G minus 6G is equal to 0 or R1 plus R2 is equal to 98 Newton. This gives us equation number 3. Similarly, if you substitute in equation number 2, we get 0.25 into R1 plus 0.05 into W1 plus 0.25 into R2 will be equal to 0. This gives us R1 minus R2 is equal to 11.76 Newton. This gives us equation number 4. From equation 3 and equation 4, we can find out the values of R1 and R2 and they are R1 is equal to 54.88 Newton while R2 is equal to 43.12 Newton. Therefore, we can say the reactions of the support at the two ends are approximately 55 Newton and 43 Newton. We take another example, a 3 meter long ladder weighing 20 kg leans on a frictionless wall, its feet rest on the floor 1 meter from the wall as shown in the figure, find the reaction forces of the wall and the floor. This is the figure, we can see the different forces which are acting on it. The wall provides the reaction, similarly the floor provides the reaction. The reaction by the wall is F1 while the normal reaction provided by the floor is N look at the direction of friction provided by the floor, it is towards the wall, while the weight of the ladder W is in vertically downward direction. The ladder AB is 3 meter long, its foot A is at a distance of AC is equal to 1 meter, which can be determined using a Pythagoras theorem. Hence, we get BC is equal to 2 meter. The forces as we have already discussed weight acting downward which will be acting at the center of gravity which happens to be the center of mass that is the, the geometrical center of the ladder as we are considering small g to be uniform. Reaction forces F1 and F2 by the wall and the floor, here force F1 is perpendicular to wall as it is frictionless while F2 force provided by the floor can be resolved into two components, the normal reaction N perpendicular to the floor and the force of friction which is towards the wall. The friction tries to prevent the sliding of the ladder away from the wall, hence it is directed towards the wall. For translational equilibrium, we can write net force is equal to 0. Taking components of forces in vertical direction, we get N minus W is equal to 0. Now, that gives us equation number 1. If we take the components of forces in the horizontal direction, then we get force of friction F small f 
minus f1 will be equal to 0, which gives us equation number 2. For rotational equilibrium, as a net torque is 0, we have to take a point about which we have to find the torques due to different forces. We take a point, in fact, we can take any point. For convenience, we will take a point capital A. Why we are taking capital A? Because we know if any force passes through the point about which we are taking the torque, then torques due to those forces is 0. So, if you look at the figure carefully, then through point A, friction and normal reaction capital N actually passes through point A. So, if we take torque about point A, we will not have to determine the torques due to these two forces. Then that means, we are left with only the determination of torque due to other two forces which are F1 and capital W or the weight of the ladder. So, our calculation becomes much easier. So, finding torques we can write down 2 into F1 minus half into W is equal to 0. Again, we have taken the positive torques as anticlockwise and the negative torques as clockwise. Now, W is equal to 20 g. If we take small g is equal to 9.8 Newton, that means W becomes 196 Newton. So, from equation number 1, if we substitute it, we get capital N is equal to 196 Newton. Using equation number 3, we can then get value of F1 will be equal to W by 4. Hence, it becomes 196 divided by 4, which is 34.6 Newton. From equation 2, we also know force of friction, which will be static force of friction will be equal to F1, which is 34.6 Newton. Similarly, we can also find F2, which is 199 Newton. F2 can be determined by the vector sum of normal reaction and frictional force. The force F2 makes an angle alpha with the horizontal. We can write tan alpha as capital N upon force of friction. The ratio of the two forces is 4. Hence, alpha can be written as tan inverse of force, which is approximately 80 degree. We can here summarize about the whole module as that a body in equilibrium must satisfy two broad conditions. They are net force acting on the body is 0, net torque acting on the body is 0 and the center of gravity for a body is a point about which it is in rotational equilibrium if only gravitational forces are considered. Thank you.